Welcome to A State of Mind. I am Paul John Dykes, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Joe Hamill. Welcome to the show, Joe. Yes. You've spoken to us today already about your career as it is with Haddington Athletic, uh, but it would be interesting for me and other football fans to hear about your illustrious career before where you are in the here and now. You're only 35, aren't you? 36. 36. 36 aye. So you're still a young man and um, you had a, a great career and, and you've played with some fantastic players, some great experiences. When you think back, we touched on this on the, the previous podcast, when you think back to playing as a youth, was it really just street football? Ah, definitely, definitely. Um, seven days a week, um, out from right after school till whatever time. Mm-hmm. Um, even back then, it was like, your doors were left open. I mean, your front doors, nobody cares. You went out. There was trust. It was, you know, t- and we touched on earlier, but just for the group of mates you had. That's what we were interested in was football. Yeah. Football, football. You maybe stopped, um, but half an hour used to go to Chippy and get like a fritter of roll in that and a, a bottle of juice. Um, right back at it. Um, but uh, they were the days. They were the days. See, when you you think back, what, what area did you um, come from? What was your. So I'm in for Adrian. I was born in um, like well, Bells Hall, but brought him like Thrash Bush, whole house. Um, loved it, loved it. Um, everything about it, to be honest, sort of. It made you who you are. It was like it was rough, mm-hmm. but when you're when you're brought up in it, you don't really see the the bigger picture. But everybody looked after each other. Um, then I moved into different wee parts. I went down to. Um, near Roy R's direction again met a group of boys that just wanted to play football and there were some incredible players mm-hmm. at that point as well um, but that was a high street football and then brought up in Airdrie was it was class you know when you look back I always think Airdrie has been a bit of a, a Rangers uh, stronghold right I believe that you were more fond of the green and white hoops yes um, through family and I don't know if that's maybe the name as well Joseph Patrick I as well so I don't know if that's it gives the game away a wee bit <laughs> um, but yeah my dad's side um, the Hamels were um, oh, massive like, massive um, so yeah um, but to be honest even, the other, even my, like my mum's side weren't really first with football so my dad's that's from my, my dad's side sort of that's where I followed the green and white Ah, definitely. And see, when you're a young kid and you're you're playing for teams, that Joe, was it more playing football than going to the games? Yes, yeah, totally. Just just play football. That that was all you you thought about. Just play football. Um, nothing else. Um, it's about go and play football. Whatever, even like kicking cans, kicking bottles. It was mental. Mm-hmm. Different, completely different times. Yeah. At what point did it get to the stage where senior clubs were showing an interest in you, Joe? So my um, I. Live with my mum and dad. Things happened in the family. Um, split up. I went and mum, dad didn't drive. So to get to football, my uncle sort of brought me up. Uh, my uncle Jerry, um, see the car. Um, so he was my, he took me here, there, and everywhere, like Perth, wherever. He mm-hmm. drove me wherever. So, like, big thanks to him. I actually moved in with him um, for that reason as well. Um, went to school from his house. And it was like, I don't know, maybe 12, 13, but he was he was a big believer, even though he didn't play at a level to, to a such, but he was, when clubs are interested in it, it's easy for parents or as, oh, there's Arsenal interested, let's go in there, there's Middlesbrough, let's go in there, let's go, let's go there. He was like, no, you're going to be limited to four clubs. He says, so you're all going to fill your head. I was like 13, 12, 13. Was they're that all, the kind of clubs that were interested, Joe? I went down to yeah. a couple of clubs, um, and other clubs were interested, but he said to me, he says, no, um, he says, they're, like, they're all going to promise you this, that, and this. They're all going to follow you doing nonsense. He says, so we'll cut it at a couple of clubs and make a decision. <laughs> so I sat down a few times. And you look at the bigger picture, it's like, how many um, how, how many youngsters have we brought through? What's the sort of youth like? Have they got to bring boys through, blah, blah, blah. Um, and eventually we picked, we picked a club. But yeah, that was it. My uncle brought me up and he sort of said, I said, Limited to so how many club you can, because it is easy to get sort of caught up in all that. Oh my wait, my boys in this club, my boys at that club. It's, it's a you hear that, right? It becomes, it does become uh, a badge of honour. I mean, if if you hear of anybody going to Arsenal mm-hmm. straight away, you think, wow, they must be some player, yeah. you know? Yeah, I went down. Um, I'm saying that because that's the one club I'm down trial and I had a stinker. 
Right. I was terrible. I went into the room and meet um, Brady. Brady and that. Um, we played against was it Mal- Samba. Remember the boy, Jeremy Samba, who played with England. Sort of, he was an unbelievable player, striker, and I was absolutely dug me. I was hopeless. So it was the next flight back up the road. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. Um, but the experience got down. And to be honest, like, I, I was dug me, but. See the bigger picture, London. It was too busy for me at that time. Yeah, I was a young lad, and it, it got to me, to be honest. And the performance on was it Friday or Saturday, whatever we played against, I was I was so bad. It must be tough though. I, even when I go to London, uh, just as a visitor, not to go down for a yeah. trial, even just the place, the whole environment, it is it's a difficult thing to take in for a young kid. Yeah, it was busy. It's busy. And the, and you know a lot of the players I speak to who goes down south, the physically. I mean, for example, Joe Wright. I'm from Fife. Yep. And we used to play for teams and we thought we were all right. And then we'd come up against maybe in the Scottish against a Tyne Castle or right. Gairdock or whatever. And then you realise actually that there's, there's levels. There's levels. Yep. Did it feel a wee bit like that when you went to, uh, down to London as well? It did. It did. It was like, um, remember changing changing rooms, etc. And you're sort of, and these boys are like machines. Mm-hmm. You know, you're young, like 15, 16 year olds, their physique, the shape of them, obviously that. Uh, all right, okay. <laughs> Again, you're you're up the road thinking you're you're eating well, you're doing well, whatever. But yeah, it's it's totally different. Mm-hmm. Totally different standing beside them. They're just, they're just men. Oh, um, scary. So you come back up the road. Uh, what was your kind of um, your breakthrough then? What, what deal came to you and you thought, right, that works for me? Um, so Harps Harps were um, looking at me for a little while. Um, here talking to us and met up with them a few times then. Played with under Billy Russell, um, under maybe 14s, 15s, 14s, um, Big Eck as well. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, couple of games with that. I enjoyed it. I was a winger, out and out winger, taking players on. Used to love it. Maybe a bit greedy at times, but so Big Billy Russell, we played it. Used to play East Coast Bride Junior pitch. Right. It was our um, home pitch for some reason. We've been part of Hearts. And I remember the changing room. He says, um, Joe, this game, you're limited to two touches. Don't take any more and two touches, you got it, or you're off. Um, so you should love to take players on. Always remember it. But um, he was brilliant. And then since that, John Murray was just uh, the chief scout. He he came to the house met uh, myself and my uncle. Um, got, got done a deal. Then went into the hearts after that. What was your experience like in terms of the, the group of players that you were coming through? If you give us an idea of who else was coming through at that time. Uh, my, well, my, that hearts age group, Took um, maybe about six in. Um, Graham Weir went on, um, famous for the, the double in the 4 4 game right at the end and against Hibs. Um, John Knox, Paul McLaughlin, Paul McMullen actually played maybe a full season at left back with Hearts. Then, who else? Big DD, David Dunn, um, Matty King. So, took a, that out of that team, a lot of them in Hearts, but then even after that, I think a few boys went on and played. Maybe we'd done battle in that as well. Mm-hmm. We'd done alright that. And uh, the Hearts boss at that time, Jim Jeffries. Jim Jeffries, the manager, and uh, Billy Brown. Um, so I was a kid, and going out to Tyne Castle, like, people ask me about the manager work with Jim Jeffries. The first team, like then, Jim Jeffries kept his cell cell in his office through there. The only time you see him was on the training pitch. Then after that, he just had in his office. And the other kid you see him walking about the corridor. Um, so it was a bit. And I always just remember one of the games, Hibs, we used to train at Pinky, and Hibs beat them. And then I was training with the, the youths, and when they got beaten, they were over the far side, and they had them in a circle, and him and Billy Brown were going mad, because Hibs beat them on the, on the Saturday, and they trained on the Sunday, whatever it is. And I'm like, and that was my, I always just remember that, he was going absolutely berserk. Um, but I, Jim Jeffries, but I, when he spoke to him, he was fine, but he sort of, but he kept himself to himself in his <laughs> office, <laughs> But I see Billy now and again as well. What about Edinburgh? But uh, yeah, they two were in charge. Of I've heard a lot of good things about Jim Jeffries. I know it was a, an old school, school approach. Um, I remember reading Lee Sharp's book, and he had a spell at Bradford, and he actually spoke really highly of Jim yeah. Jeffries. He said he was a proper manager. Mm-hmm. I think he had some bad experiences with some of his previous uh, gaffers. When the time comes and you're progressing and you're performing well for that first team call up, Joe, talk us through that. So that was. Um, it was actually Craig Levine. Craig Levine came into Harps and we were um, 
training. Craig, to be fair, used to always come to the the under 18s games. He used to follow the kids everywhere and he spoke at half time to the team, even though John McGlynn was in charge of the team. But the when your manager clearly been turned up your lap and he speak to you at half time, then after the game if you didn't do well, he sort of let you know. Right. Um he's an honor but a big big chap. Um so actually done all right for the, the youth then I think within a couple of weeks they coming in, had a few training sessions with the first team. Um then back there, nothing like just training with him that I was also playing with the with John McGlynn's team. Um then I think after so it's in a year, training more, training more. Then Craig says, hey, you're in the squad for um, But with, with Craig's forces, he said right from the start, we had the meetings, he says, like, work hard. He says, one but one big thing, if you give the ball away, don't, I don't probably see people chuck their hands in there. Jesus Christ. Go and win it back. Mm-hmm. Just try your best to win it back. Um, and that all stuck in my mind, just go and get it back, go and work hard. And, um, so Craig was a big thing for giving my chance, and they didn't give him a break. Mm-hmm. See, when you look at Craig Levine's career, and it was on the up and up. You know, the managerial career from Hearts to Dundee United, and yeah. you're looking at what he's doing. He eventually gets a national, the international job for Scotland. Um, do you rate him? Do you regard him that highly when you think back to your early career and, and him in his early days as a coach? What What Craig was good at, um, even from the Hearts. So Craig came in, and I think his it was you know, the budget. Craig was good at sort of maybe getting the ready top earners and bringing boys through and getting players in on less money. Then, so sort of Hartson also had to do that at Leicester. That was a big thing. Leicester with him as well. Um, get ready to get boys maybe on 60 grand and start again. So, what your money is, it's and all that, not crazy money. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I think at Harps, I thought he'd done outstanding his first time at Harps. Then, even at Leicester, considering what he had to, had to do, I thought he'd done a, a good job. Um, but yeah, his career could it then international. Well, did he have a chance? He probably did. He probably did for what he what he done. So mm-hmm. unfortunately, it just didn't, it didn't work out. So. Now, as a young footballer, you everybody has this dream that you're going to make it. You're going to play first team football. What changes once you make that breakthrough in terms of you walking down the street as you know as a Hearts player, somebody that's actually playing? It's attractive. It's attractive for guys because they want to come and talk to you. It's attractive for girls because they want to hang off the end of your mm-hmm. your, your your arm kind of thing. And you see it all the time, Joe. I mean, how difficult is it to go from a young aspiring footballer to a professional footballer that people start recognising? Hey, going on being a footballer, like probably ninety percent of them. Once you you've got your mind, you want to be a footballer, even at schools, it's maybe a bad thing, but everything else goes out the window for me. You know what I mean, it was like I don't care. The teachers saying whatever, but ah, I don't care. You say I'm going to football. No matter what you say, I'm going to football. That's what I'm thinking about. Um, and it's like, yeah, you're just driven by playing every day, training every day. I'm, I don't care. I'm just going to be a footballer, 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 footballer. I'm going to get this, I'm going to get that. Um, but then, so once you sort of playing a couple of games in the first team, it's it, it was weird. Like you're getting three things in. You would like it was crazy. It, it was really, really mad. Um, people would recognise you. People would again come up and speak to you. They, they didn't really knew. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I've always been one for speaking to everybody. I mean, um, I, I don't think I made it. That's a big thing. I don't think I made it as a footballer. Um, somebody said, asked me a question years ago. When would you say you made it a footballer? Do you know, I've actually not got an answer. I think it might be down to a personal thing. Um, is it when You've made millions of pounds. Is it when you've play, played 500 games? Is it, I mean, I don't know yeah. what, how somebody says you've made that. Mm-hmm. There's a personal thing. I didn't think I made that. I, I, was, I was fortunate enough to play in the first team and have a wee, a good living out of it. Um, but you made it, I want to say, is I made it, made it. But yeah, I've, things changed. Um, you got like discounts off of things. You got, it was, yeah, people speaking to you and it was, it was weird. It was good, good. I think some players find that difficult, that transition from being a face in the crowd to being recognised and definitely all these perks. Definitely. So yeah, mm-hmm. some people um, some people it's too much for them. Um like I, I like to keep myself safe. I have my wife, my kids, and everybody knows me. I'm mad about dogs. Animals, but dogs is my thing. Um put me in the country, I don't know, and dogs and I'm happy. Um, maybe more there. That's me sorted. 
Um, but I feel like I've got good that I've got my wife and my kids and the family's been tight. But it's for some people having that sort of people knowing you all the time, knowing what you're getting up to, sort of speaking to you, wanting to speak to you, try to even saying bad things about you, you know what I mean? It's, mm. it's, it's a bit sort of intense for people. Um, unfortunately, I've, I never really had any bad experience experiences. Um, so I was lucky, but I, I just took it, as I just seen it as a, as a, as what you call it, a job. Well, I mean, I don't know, so I said, oh, I'm not mm-hmm. no, but I don't think so, unless somebody's got another, other things in mind that I've, what you call it, probably big balls. I mean, no, this, carry on. I just thought it was, it was normal. Um, I wanted to be a footballer. That's what it was a job. That was it. I was getting, I was just getting paid to play football, what I loved. Um, but I, that's what I've seen. It's, it's just another job. So it's somebody like, I don't know, like driving a bus to, that's their job. My always being a footballer. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a really humble and kind of way to put it across, Joe, because obviously a lot of people it goes right to their head and it affects their game and their career ultimately. When you look at um, the managers that you played under at Hearts, it, it was a managerial merry-go-round, right? But it, what an interesting time to play for Hearts because obviously you bring in people like, obviously, Romanov comes in and uh, you play under a host of different managers going from John Robertson right through to Craig Burley. What's your memories of the Romanov era? Well, I can remember um, it was interesting. <laughs> interesting, um, I bet. <laughs> it was, um, there was one There was one day we came in to training um, and Romanov was obviously in about the club, but there was one day we were all kitted up going to train. So we went over up at Rickham, over the grass pitches. But all of a sudden there was like 30, 40 like, foreigners over and they were on the Astro turf. Um, doing a bounce game. Well, this is this is mad. This is this is weird. Um, so they had a game this day, and I always just remember it because after that, I made a decision um, what happened. So the next day from that game, they'd signed so many players from that, and that's I think that's the way they were going forward. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah, in, you know, there, There's loads of them. I can't name all of them. So right away, I'm at. He's in charge. He's got also in the club. This is the way he wants to get all these these boys in now. Um, so my game time's got to be limited and no matter what money was chucked to you whatever you do just want to play football you know I mean so good getting this this money that, but see at the end of the day if you to ask I know Wayne Rooney's playing at Derby now but he wants to sit on the bench he wants to be playing you just want to play it's mm-hmm. no good to sit on the bench um, no matter what age you are so right away it's like yeah, I just want to play it's limited so um, I so Romanov said it was was interesting Um a couple of done all right with it, so they did uh, once I left and the manager got in. But he's, um, yeah, it was different. A different approach entirely. I mean, what there thereafter happened is we had the situation, Joe, with the Rickerton three, as it's called, with Craig Gordon, Paul Hartley, Stephen Presley. Yeah. I mean, mutiny in the camp. I'm guessing Presley was a leader. Brilliant. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. Presley, um, when, we, when I first went in, right away with the youths, he looked after them. Mm-hmm. Um, if it, anything, if they needed kit, he made sure the young boys got kit. If it was like if they were due bonuses, he made sure they got bonuses. Even just as big thing was for praising kids. Um, so if you done something well, I mean like a like a, a pass, but it was like fired in. It was that brilliant, brilliant pass. Well done, son. But also, if you didn't work back or anything, he would let you know. I mean, but overall, he's the things for looking after his team because he was a club captain. Ah, oh, top notch, brilliant, brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, Craig Gordon was um, just just older than me, but even coming up with Craig, he was like he's still not changed. Just a normal chat went on. He was at nine, nine million, nine million <laughs> quid. Uh, yeah. Sunderland, and he's just it wouldn't walk by you. Um, and Paul Hartley came in from Craig, uh, Craig brought him in. And what a career he ended up having as well. Um, Seiko was, that was his nickname, Seiko. And, and training, just relentless as well. Um, encouraging kids and just want just want the best for the boys coming through. See, when you look at that trio, yep. they all ended up at Celtic, incidentally. Yeah, but when you look at that trio and taking that stand against the owner of the club, I mean, it's brave. Was there discussions at, in the dressing room or at, at training? To be honest with you, I didn't hear anything. Uh, like that, um, 
But I think with those, um, but I didn't hear anything about um, if they were chatting what was going on, what was going on. But yeah, it was brave. Um, but that was the belief, and that's what they they wanted to do. So we've done it. Again, as a Celtic fan, uh, I looked at that season and I looked at um, Burley, George Burley coming in, and it looked that we actually might have a challenge from outside the big two in Glasgow. Yep. And as a, a someone with an affinity with Hearts or a Hearts fan, you must look back on that with some regret because obviously it was ruined for non-footballing reasons, wasn't it? It certainly was. It certainly was. And um, like you see, everybody's buzzing because how close we're getting to splitting the splitting the old firm, etc. and doing so well. And then all of a sudden it's just like, yeah, it's just wasted. Far too much uh, interference then from the, the highest echelons of the club. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. It just shows you, though, I mean, it got to a point where had there been a wee bit of um, what you would say, you know, an injection of cash to bring in a couple of more, more players, then you're going toe-to-toe with what was then the, the old yeah. firm, yeah. you know. But it, it is unfortunate for players like yourself looking back. You'd made your mind up because you'd seen the interference of Romanov and, his, and the, uh, the people that were round about him. And you made that decision, obviously, to move on. Did you have a good relationship with Craig Levine or was it a surprise when he came back in to sign you for Leicester? Um, yeah, a bit of both. Um, because I can remember those two stories. Um, actually, not want to anyway, but I, I was silly when I was um, young. Just done daft things. And at Harps, um, there was once we were um, Scotland youths, you to go down training at Largs, etc. And Craig was obviously at Nationalist. Um, so I went down a few times and went away with Scotland, but this time it was like, I, came in, ah, I didn't go. You know, a, an email came in saying Joe Hamill selected for whatever age group it was, and I didn't go. So on Monday morning, we should have been away for the weekend. Okay, came in, he says, and he went absolutely nuts. I mean, now he's young still as well, and he went mental. He said, Do you know what this means? He says, um, Playing for your country, he says, blah, 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 blah. And um, he said, I actually feel like just when you get stuff and just don't come back and I'm like right, okay so there's that instant and then there's two instances going out in the training field and now that way you're collecting balls in and you're kicking them back to the bags just to collect them all in and I've hit one right off and I'm, I'm a young lad and he's just turned around and he's just I'm like oh, no no and I think it was maybe two days later I've done it again right <laughs> off he said I'm like oh no so if it's basically ready to get ready for no turn up to the Scotland thing and hitting away ball twice, he's just ready to get ready to make that. How is it always you? How is it always you? But um, but other than that, it was like from a playing side of it, he um, he was fine. He, as I touched on it, he worked hard um, for the team, and you've got a chance. You've got a chance. Then yeah, he went he went to Leicester. Touched on hearts. Hearts off him in our contract. Um, which seems sad that I really, really enjoyed my time at Hearts, really, because I came through from Airdrie, what, 14, 15, stayed in Dykes. Um, but see, coming through um, at Hearts, or maybe any club, if you're a young boy, the fans take to you. Um, yeah. Maybe not like your player, no doubt, you're good enough for the majority of them, but they still take to you because you've you broke through and you've tried, etc. They, they, were, they were really, really good. Um, but even everything else about the club, uh, working under John Hoosty, then for him, even the family, and uh, like, make the decision to go elsewhere here um, was a big thing. And then Craig came in, it was Dan Jackson who was dealing with it. Um, he said, uh, Craig wants you down. Not young. And any opportunity down in England, I've said to anyone, um, I say, go. Yeah. Even abroad, I was in Sweden and playing, but go, go, go and try it. If it doesn't work out, you've tried it. Um, so, I said to Jacko, I says, hi, fine. Um, what is it? Blah, blah, blah. And he said, the deal. I says, cool. Um, he said, who's still phone you? So I think within five minutes, who's still phone me and says, do you need to be down here? You're training tomorrow. I'm in Edinburgh. And I'm driving on uh, day one. I'm actually going home. I said to phone like my girlfriend at the time, my phone's at the time. I says, I have to be in Leicester tomorrow. I'm training at 10 o'clock. And she had no idea that it was just weird. It was just so surreal that, no, this isn't meant to happen. So I so I went home, packed whatever I could in the car and headed down and I, they booked into the Halton. Um, that was it. 
Right. Just weird, just happened like mm-hmm. over like that, not even overnight, just bang. The big thing as well, you're talking about getting a move and then you're moving country uh, a couple of times. Uh, it's a big upheaval when you've got a partner, wife, kids, that kind of thing. And obviously you need the support of your partner. Yeah. So was she quite happy for you just to um, head down? Well, not really, but she knew like that was that was she knew it was football daft. And she was a Hearts fan actually. Um, right. even before I met her. Um but she knew it was just football was that was my focus, football. Um just the way I treated football, how I looked at myself like I, I don't drink tea total, don't smoke, never touched it. Um I was always trying to keep myself as I can and eat blah blah blah. So she she knew, right, it's an opportunity. I went down myself, she stayed up here. So I was in the Hilton Hotel for maybe five months myself. Right. right. Um so I was saying I was young, but I was in the hotel with Patrick Cosnorbo, who left Hearts as well. He was down, he was in the hotel, Stephen Hughes. Right. Every time. So they were still in the hotel living, like a massive hotel, like dogs and everything in it. <laughs> um the gym and so from that, say, like I knew Paddy from Hearts, so it was it wasn't a, also what helped me. I moved away from home. I say when I was fourteen, fifteen. So moving from our country myself wasn't a big thing, but leaving my missus mm-hmm. and that up here um, for a while was was a bit hard um, because we're, we're close. Even with my missus family, um, we're really really close. So yeah, it is what it is. You have to sort of sacrifice things. To try and better your, your life and your Absolutely. career. So, yeah, I went down. Then I said after maybe four or five months, we um, we got a place. Then she came down and stayed with us. You know, when you look back on the experience of going down to Arsenal, mm-hmm. speaking to Liam Brady, a world-renowned footballer, and I know it didn't work out at Celtic, but what a player, you know, and made his name with, um, in Italy and, and for the Republic of Ireland and. You thought yourself at that time, you're looking at the physicality of the players that you are maybe training with, that you're maybe a bit short. Yep. But the time you went down, did you have it, the, the confidence that you could go down there and actually make it in the English game? Well, see, see when I went down, I, you know, I didn't think that um, West English is less than bonus. With you. I, was, I was young, so I was still in the mind that just give me a ball and I'll go and do what I can do. Mm-hmm. Um, in my first couple of training sessions, I actually thought I had done really, really well. Um, but then eventually it sort of started. Uh, like I played, I think it was the first cup games as well. I scored my first cup game, um, 15 games. I was only there end up for a season, like for the way things worked out. Um, but I can remember just standing in the tunnel um, down there. So you went to the, the, the programme was turn up to training, you went in and done a sort of warm up. You went into the gym before you went and trained, which is a new thing uh, for me. So you done a sort of bit of upper body stuff and legs and you went out, but then stand in the tunnel with people. They're just up here, they're just like this, and just athletes. It's, it's yeah, it still felt like a, a wee boy mm-hmm. um, at times. I did go down young. Um so it was sometimes you like I don't I don't regret anything, but you just think sometimes you think like, see if I just done that a wee bit and just sort of try that, whatever, um, which is it's like that, but just just go and do it. Just be free and um but yeah, sometimes you're just um so it was, it was totally different, different breed it looks like. Why do you think it didn't work out for Craig Levine down there? I think it started on where I said like I touched on he I think they brought him in for um get ready all the top earners. No money, um what happened. Um he'd done that. He brought down a lot of um, boys he'd worked under at Harps, Al Mabry, because Norbo, De Vries, Big Brad Douglas, Stephen Hughes was there. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I think maybe eventually, with the same style, it probably had to change a bit after it because he got them to be solid. Um, I'm not conceding many goals, but then some, sometimes you just need to be back. Just going. Express yourself a little bit more, and, but it never ever came. Mm-hmm. Never came. I think it sort of came back to. See, when I'm thinking about you going down there and living in a hotel, even that seems absurd. You know, it must be difficult. Yeah. There's so many vices in the world of football, and we've heard so many times the reasons for it. You know, be that maybe too much time on your hands, getting really good money at a young age, yeah. but also that attraction for some of the 
other elements um, in life to try and attach themselves to you. And I know that, you know, people who are gangsters, uh, for want of a better word, sometimes try and attach themselves to footballers, um, get them under their wing, etc. So we're talking about vices, but everything that you've said to me today, you're a family man, you're a teetotaler, you're looking after your debt, your your diet, um, you're a professional, then he smoke, that kind of thing. So there, there is always vices there for football. And it was, was gambling. Yeah. When did that happen? When was the, was it something that pre-football you, you liked to bet or you liked to puggies? How, how did that come into your life, Joe? Never, um, never when I was younger. It was just um, like, I never had money. Like, very rarely did I have pocket money. Um, when I was growing up, never had money, never had a board. I mean, it was just to collect like remember, ginger bottles, mm -hmm. family bottles, 20p used to get for it. So any workies used to carry a bag. That was the money I got to show up the name. The other kids like your mum, your mum, your uncle would give you a colour pound or weddings would be scrambles. That's, you know, that's what we call it through in every, but that's where you can sort of get your money. But then once you sort of start, I think it's 16, you sign your contract with Harps and there's money in your bank. You know that. If a boy leaving school and nothing, then all of a sudden you're getting... It was 120 pound a week, my first. Lap. Wow, I'm all in here. But yeah, gambling was my big thing. And 120 pound a week, we're getting paid weekly then. Um, it didn't take long before I found um, I was sort of in the bookies, mm -hmm. um, roulette machines. Um, then, as you said, time on your hands, you're sort of training, maybe. We were in, you were in it maybe nine, half nine, but sometimes you could be way by three o'clock. And from being from a different place, every Edinburgh, yeah, what else do you do? You live in digs. Sometimes you go and play snooker, but nine times out of ten, I was sitting in the bookies. Um, and it just progressed um, from maybe betting a couple of pounds on roulette machine. Very rarely was it a football coupon. Very, right. very rarely. Mm -hmm. um, it was either. It was the machines, the roulette machines. It just got me, got me hooked. And as the sort of money went up, contract wise, the the bets on the machine got higher and higher as well. And it just sort of escalated for there. Um, and it, it got it got, got serious. So from I don't know how long, but when you can first enter the bookies, what age? I don't know, it's 16, 17. That's that's when it went in. Mm -hmm. And until no, I had a I touched a relationship with machine for a number, number of years, number of years. Um, but it's there's other stories to this where you were at training and you would you would train, but what you're focused on, like I'm just want to get, I want to try and get zero and then green to zero. You bet, I want to try and you saw hammer zero, zero. So you're training, you're thinking, just wonder if it'll come in the day. I didn't get it yesterday, mate. Come in the day. I'm at training thinking this. Mm -hmm. um, then that's leading on to games. You're just thinking about your betting, and even sometimes you are at training. But then you meant to go to training, but you just go and sit in the bookies. No time to training, so I escalated to where even though I was sort of top, like trying to be a professional, this just got ingrained into you. You want to bet, you want to get money, you want to win money. You want this. You don't want to get the machine to get the better of you because you always think it's not a machine. There's something behind the counter pressing a button. It's, it's stitching me up here. So, um, yeah, say as well, there's, as you got more money through your career, more money actually went into the, yep. the machines. Mm -hmm. um, lab routes, well, how, um, many more. And so what, what used to happen as well, so back then it was, um, you couldn't do it on your phone or whatever it is. I think it wasn't even a, what do you call it? A smartphone at the end. All that. Just a phone and a text, that's all you could do in it. So it was in the bookies, sitting all day, wasting your money. Um, go home, and come next Friday and get paid again. Mm -hmm. um, it was like, it, it was just relentless. It was it was relentless and then it got that bad where it was like, you were betting on virtual racing, like even TriCast on Kid on Horses. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're betting what's to come first, second and third. And and even other things form sort of it was crazy. I got that. It was it got that bad. Um, 
speaking about sort of it's bringing back it's not, it was a nice was a nice t- place to be um it did affect my football it affected my life with my with my wife uh, back then it was my girlfriend fiance but to be fair she stuck by me mm-hmm. which was probably a big big thing um probably the biggest thing um so uh credit to her and what one thing as well the money i was gambling i never ever ever owed anyone a penny or a pound every money every penny was mine so i don't know if that was a bad thing good thing because if, if i was just was in the, the shop with you gambling if i had to say to you give me 100 pound that time i think i would have stopped right because i didn't want to go any debt with anyone and um, i just wanted it as my money um so i think if it was that if i owed someone money i think right away right now so then it wasn't it was all my money all my money i was wasting and um I just escalated more and more money, more and more money, more time. And then we went to a pro. Um, you were finished by sometimes half twelve. Yeah. On a Friday, we used to train at Harps, Leicester as well, other clubs. You were finished, maybe, I'd say, train at 10, half 10. You were finished by half 12. So you're all the time your hands. To, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not saying it's an excuse, but... like It certainly contributes to it, doesn't it? Yep, yep. Um, in fact, I didn't have my dog, so I don't know if that was... Um, but then I get into a factor as well. So I'm like getting dogs and still gambling, kind on taking dogs a walk. I'll sit in the bookies. The dogs are maybe you know, getting a walk. Um, yeah, it was just, it was horrible, horrible, um, horrible, horrible times. And hence why I'm having to work. Now, I'm just, actually just done an overnight this morning and finished at half eight this morning. Um, or I'd be comfortable if you want to. You know, Absolutely. But yeah. it is what it is. I mean, I didn't drink and smoke. But I gambled, um, put people in my way through a lot, a lot of grief, and her family. Um, but what what came from I um, I had I used to hide a lot of things, make up excuses. Can't honestly say they're never about. I would used to jump about different bookies out to like Penny Cook, out to Bonnerig, or around sitting in one one bookies, um, and just waste money. Was it like your your whole week's wages? Everything. Yeah. So back then, I said there was no phones. So what you could do is, how much could you draw at the bank back then? Maybe three hundred fifty pounds, three hundred pounds. So you take that out of your bank card, spend that, then you'd actually go into the bank and draw out whatever you want. Then what they brought in, you could actually hand your bank card over the counter in the bookies, right? And say, uh, machine four, can you put a hundred pound on machine four. And a spin's what, if you do a, roulette, a spin on roulette, I think it's less than, I might be even seven, eight seconds. So you could lose £100 in seven seconds. Um, it just goes, goes and goes. In time, you don't think about it, but if you, add, you sit back and add it up now, wow. Yeah. How many years do you think it was a problem, Joe? Oh, 10, 15 years? Yeah, yep. yeah every day. And I see, I, I was hiding it for a lot of people and maybe putting on a front. Mm-hmm. Um, thinking everyone was all right, but it definitely affected my my game, my yeah. training. Um, I always think I was a professional, even though I would gamble. I was still trying to eat the same, but even your sleeping habits, because you're just thinking, gambling. I want to go to the bookies. I want to go to the bookies. I want to bet. I want to. Um, it actually became a stage where I said you're losing thousands. You're maybe winning thousands, 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 of, thousands of pounds, but. The next day, you're going in with that money and losing it. Mm-hmm. So it was going nowhere. Um, uh, it just got to a stage where I, it was just—it was horrible. And one day, I—I I, don't—I don't know why it stopped. One day, I just—I just stopped. There was no reason. My kids were young at the time, so it probably was affected, but not as much as if they were older. They see many bookies every day. They didn't see that. And I don't know if maybe once they were going, I said, "Joe, oh, they've got to see me." Mm-hmm. That'd be an absolute pump. Um, certain bookies. I mean, I want to, I want to be a footballer. I've seen that. I've had people sort of saying, I said, come up for signatures, and I was loving it, pictures, blah, blah, blah. Just being normal, but also, and I've turned into a, maybe a horrible person to my, my fiance at the time, because I'm gambling, and it's affecting the household and making life difficult for people um, all around. So it was, it was tough. You're still involved in the game today. I and mean, when I look around the game, not just in Scotland, all over, all you see is gambling adverts. So the, the top three trophies in Scotland, it's a gambling firm. Yep. 
all the top clubs gambling yeah. companies on the, the front of the jerseys. Yeah. When I started up the podcast, the only sponsorship I could get was a gambling firm, right? So you're appealing to a working class audience, which yeah. is the football support, and it's constant gambling, gambling, gambling. Do you think there needs to be more of a responsibility in the authorities, Joe, because there's so many stories like yourself where footballers have got into trouble and they've lost everything, yeah. right? Yeah. Is there more that can be done either by the authorities or by the clubs themselves with the young kids coming through? Do you know, they have they have tried and they probably are trying. Um, I know now they've limited the, the maximum bet, mm -hmm. or, um, but you can still, you know, it's, I know it's a minimal bet, but you could you could still sit in there all day. Like, I used to go from opening time, 9 o'clock, till I used to start at 10 o'clock, 9 till 10, 9 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. I really? Sit, uh, um, and it's, it's, it's that horrible to start thinking about now, but I no, days and days and days, 9 o'clock in the morning, as soon as it opened, till 10 o'clock at night, like, you got that friendly with the staff, they knew you, everything about you, you were in constant, they would treat you to coffees, obviously, and teas, and, but no, clubs are, Clubs are even the even the betting things you see it now like responsible gambling. No, I mean if you think it's too much phone, blah blah blah. But big, I think the big thing about gamblers, if you are gambling, anyone, if footballers, whatever, just talk about it to somebody because mm -hmm. it just maybe takes that once. Then once you start opening up and like, do you know what, it's affecting everyone. And it might might lead to one person just stopping rather than wasting. Yeah, there's there's players moved abroad because a lot of different people are after them. That, um, but I said I didn't get to that stage with me. I lost, I said, a lot, a lot of money where I wouldn't need to work and I would be comfortable. Mm -hmm. But it is I'm working. I like my job. Um, but it's yeah. If you if you know you've got, don't hide it. Don't make excuses. Um, talk to anyone, anyone, mm -hmm. um, because you take that thing. I said to. Bring it out, it's off your, off your chest, whatever, and you're just free. And then it, yeah, one person out of a hundred, I'd be happy if they stopped. It could, uh, it could save somebody's marriage, somebody's life. Some people commit suicide for it. Yeah. So, um, how how is that affecting your mental health? Well, I, I think yeah, it, it was tough. Um, the amount of times you didn't want to go home because you'd lost so much money, mm -hmm. um, and. Yeah, just honestly thinking about it now, it's it's actually given me the goosebumps because it's it's lost a lot of money, lost a lot of money, and affected just how bad it must have affected my wife as well. Um, what I put her through, um, she stopped by me, but our, our career, uh, my football career, um, I, I don't think it was good enough to to make it the pro. That's my. Like, I'm not looking for anything. Like, that's my belief. I didn't. I wasn't. I wasn't good enough um, to make it at that level. Um, you maybe have sort of found my level lower down, but I think helping me to try and progress and push myself there. I think the gambling held me back. It's been tough. Yeah, and mentally, as you <laughs> say, if you you can think all I want, you have had good sleep on Friday. I'm ready, but you're thinking about gambling. Yeah, even how much even you've during lost the games, Friday, yeah. how much you lost that Friday, then the Saturday, then I see. I didn't do many football coupons. I didn't, it wasn't one. It was crazy. You know, I gambled on other crazy bets. But it was never really, really football bets. Um, but yeah, on the Saturday, you're just you're just thinking about enjoy time gambling. You must have a lot of sympathy for uh, people like Brian Rice who come out and speak about it as well, Joe, you know, and, you know, some high profile ex-players like John Hartson, who's now an ambassador to try and help people yeah. and he still goes to the meetings. But you've managed to deal with this without yeah. going to the gambling anonymous meetings. Yeah. With the meetings, um, I didn't go to any. Um, people just say, I've got a lot of them, but it was like one of the ones I'm, I was in my head as well. I've not, I've not got a problem. I've not got a problem, but I have. Mm -hmm. um, but I know a couple of people that used to go along to the meetings on just say a Wednesday, Wednesday night, whatever it was at the time. But see, on the Tuesday, I was in the bookies with them, you know, gambling. So they were going to go to meetings. I'm this such. I've not a bet in months and months. You know, gambling Tuesday. So they're basically lying. Um, so, yeah, there might be an outcome at the thing you go to the meetings, but it comes down to self. Mm -hmm. You need to do it. You need to want to do it. Um, and I say I think by opening it up to people, 
then that's you coming out right away. It's you. You're making, you're taking responsibility yourself. Um, like my wife's not got to make me stop. No matter what she said, I'm going to leave you. I know it has been that's easy to say, but or you know, go to the house. You know, go to. It comes down to yourself. Mm-hmm. You need to have that. But I'm, I'm giving up. That's it. Nothing else. And and it sounds as though the motivation was your kids. You're looking at your kids. You want to make them proud of their dad. Oh, I didn't want them to know? see sitting in the bookies being an absolute a waster. Mm-hmm. Um, all your days and for what you've done. Um, we got a roof overhead, etc. But then, no son, I'll tell you what, baby, my dad's in there. Even his wee pal, my dad used to go down there all the time. No. no. Like now, I might say something like there's a culture of gambling in football, and it's a throwaway remark because how would I know? I've heard a lot of people talking about it, but how would I know? You were within the bills of Scottish football, you saw it for yourself. Was it a big issue in your day? Massive, massive. I think probably everyone. Gambled, mm-hmm. to be honest. Maybe not to the, to the extent that I, I went through around most people went more, but I think, yeah, most people are butter on your Saturday football, your horses. Um, yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's right, just right through um, through football. Yeah, I know that like a few people get pulled out of it, didn't they, recently as well? I remember a couple of years ago, uh, back in that time, yeah, that thing. but to be honest, you know, everybody does it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's it's a big thing um, and it we touched on I do think the gamble you have how you see adverts sort of helping lab groups etc there's more um, and clubs are trying to try but it's got to be hard because you, people's got it on their phones mm-hmm. um, and smartphones you can have a bet any it takes a couple of seconds that there's a bet done yeah it's hard well I would say is thanks for sharing that with us because as you as you were saying earlier Joe someone may tune in and this might resonate with them. Yeah. And it might, you know, there might be a light bulb moment. They might go and speak to someone and it might start to change because we don't want people losing their livelihoods, their partners, their houses, sometimes their lives, unfortunately. But um, let's talk about something a wee bit brighter. So thank sure. you very much sure. for sharing that. <laughs> um, your next port of call, and, and this is a club that intrigues me in many ways. You, you went to Livingston. Talk to me about some of the players that you played alongside and you saw coming through the ranks at Livy. Well, look at now, they're actually multi-millionaires, millions they could have made the club through them. Yeah, um, I might miss a few, but there's like there's Graeme Dones down south of West Brom, link with Arsenal as well and everything. Robert Snodgrass, international players, James McPay, Dave McKay, Murray Davison, Lee Griffiths, Mark McNulty. Another one was actually Andy Halliday, Stefan Skugel. Mm-hmm. Um, there is probably more, um, but... It's the talent was unbelievable. unbelievable. What, what I mean, what was their the magic that they were weaving down there? I know. Um, was it the youth? Um, Graham Robertson was the he used to take the, the youth section there. Right. Um, he played with them filming for many years. Uh, yep. So he was in um, Al Cleland, that were um, yeah. But it's yeah, when you think of it, the players they had and even the team the way they played, but like some of the oh, the ability. The ones I mentioned, Snodgrass and Dawn, so oh my god. But you're saying Snodgrass, he might have been um a joker and all the rest of it off the pitch, but when it came to that game, oh. he was a true professional, yeah. A- anybody that knows Snoddy, any club being he's not he's obviously he's just the character he possession. I mean he's he's one to have in your team, like he'll have a carry on, he'll slag everybody and anybody. But as soon as on your way to training in the car, he'll wind people up left right centre, gets to training, it's focused. Hundred percent training. Um, if if you're not doing it in training, it'll let you know. It'll slaughter you. But once training's done, he's your best mate. On a Saturday as well, it's like a hundred percent. But it's just has. Um, it reminds me of Michael Stewart. I played with Michael Stewart at Hearts, right? And Mikey was like, if if you don't get the body, Mikey, you're here now. I mean, you've got another pass. But if you don't get to him, you're here. He's actually was not, but he just wants. Everything like, has to be perfect and he just wants the best. And it, it was brilliant because even though like Snoddy was younger than me, um and I was I don't even come up, but learning for Snoddy was, was something else. Mm-hmm. Um a guy that can just honestly can just switch it from taking the mic out of you two minutes ago or taking the mic out I'm talking about you throwing top pros to wind them up <laughs> to all of a sudden producing what he produced on a training field in a match day. Is phenomenal, phenomenal. What a player! What a player. See, it, it obviously came as no surprise to you when you seen him 
going like that, his career, the trajectory. Uh, Lee Griffiths, again, there's a pair of signed Lee Griffiths boots just through there in the studio there. Uh, Special, special talent. He's had his troubles uh, in recent times. When you were seeing that on the news and stuff, and it's your old pal from Livingston, you must have felt a lot of sympathy because you'd seen it yourself. Yeah, well, me and um, we we had a little group at Livingston, um, if you want to go back to the gambling, but I'm not going to stick to my body up, but we um, we used to travel through together as well, me and we all the time, we used to be up at Robbie Centre and Black Brooks and that, and sit on it. They, and yeah, at least had these troubles, but as a, you know, as a person, yeah, that's what I see what he does. Like, I, I don't have any issues. Lee does what he does, but what he produces on a football pitch, nobody can question. Nobody can question. He bangs in the goals. Mm-hmm. He's a goal scorer. That's what he is. He does things like nobody else would do. He has shots for crazy angles, but nine times out of ten, he's a target. Um, he's just a, I got on really, really well right for right for the go off at uh, Levy and it's just one of the players like I it'll just it'll just do something. Like you'll have a shot, as I say, for crazy angles there or something, you're you're one up, you're like, wow. Just that he's a he's a special, special talent. You know, when I consider the talent of Griffiths, Lee Griffiths, I think he's the best Scottish striker we've got. Oh. And it's important to get them back in. Yeah. I've seen a wee bit of man management. You're a manager yourself now from Neil Lennon, yeah. where, where he's he's basically given him a kick up the arse right. over the last right. couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that how Lee Griffiths responds? Some Billy seems because like I think he scored against Hibs and all that, haven't he? Some goal as well. Um, players are different. Um, Lee's, I would say Lee is, obviously he's getting older as well and he's start looking after himself because when you're younger, well, I'm not saying it's but no matter what you eat, your training, it sort of comes off. Once you get older, things seem to stick to you more and um, and he's getting older as well. But we, me, we, I would be tight, like, go, well, I'm pretty much doing it once. Yeah, train, train hard, make sure you're focused, but it's like, he's got something. You know I mean, some people, like the arm in the shoulder, and I'll come on, son, some people, some people do like a tailing off, I actually say. Um, but with things that Lee has like that, go and let him just be who he wants to be and he'll, he'll produce for you on the Saturday. Mm-hmm. He's, he just said with Scotland how he's I thought he should have been in number nine for Scotland in many games but you never ever seen him we'll it was during the Gordon Strachan era wasn't it it took him ages to he eventually the top he's off his shoulder he's sharp he, I said he'll just do something out of the blue but it was it was weird not seeing him um, feature for Scotland a couple of games like that go get your goals mm-hmm. chances in the box whatever he's there uh, ah, he's um, he's been on and done a, a great career and he's still playing, he's still banging the goal. So, yeah, yeah. like your time at Hearts, you had a plethora of managers at Livingston, but we were having a wee chat about some of the different methods. And of course, when um, let me get his name right here, Roberto Landi, the Landy, Italian, yeah. um, the methods yeah. were completely different. Yeah, so growing up, anybody maybe in Scotland, uh, in England as well, you were um. Training was maybe 10 o'clock, half 10 to whatever, 1, half 12. So, and you had your Wednesday off. Train the Monday, double session of Tuesday normally, Wednesday off, train Thursday, light session of Friday, game on Saturday. Obviously. So that was like 9 or 10 to 12. Livingston Italians came in. Right away. Uh, report for training, 3 o'clock. So their method is, you play at 3 o'clock on a Saturday, you train at 3 o'clock so your body's right for it your mindset for it but from any age growing up till now to try and get your body to switch then it was crazy mm-hmm. you're sitting about all day and um, waiting to go to training and nobody everybody club with Jane it was just nobody took to it nobody took to it um, they tried their best Italians there was that few of them come in um, and even the boy Rafa De Vita who was at live as well he was sort of getting thing with him, by the way and um, and he was sort of trying to explain it, yeah, this is what they do. And but Rafa knew as well it's it didn't cut it, it was it didn't sort of it didn't work. Um even I got on really, really well with them, really well with the Italians. Um they actually gave me a a good deal, which ended up coming back to sort of bite me in the backside regarding I had to go elsewhere because it but yeah, even at Livy they how was it Jazza, James McPate brought this up on something that they took his, um, was it Sparky Griffiths? So, based on Livy, the Italians took us into the Ramada at Livy mm-hmm. and made us stay there at Livy. So, your boys stayed at Livingston who are from Livingston, yeah, they couldn't go home. I'm just in Edinburgh up the road, 
boys through the West, but they all brought us into the Ramada in the middle of Livingston. You know, they could go anywhere. It was just, it was just weird. That's bizarre. Because if you went like abroad or something, you're just in the middle of living, you couldn't go see it. Oh, it was just, yeah, and they had the way, even we done um, certain drills. So he, he's big, he, he did want to see, see if you had flair. He wanted you just to go and play, to be fair. He did. If you've got some, go and, go and play. But he done like a, a shape thing, full size pitch. You're starting a living with a couple of subs, like three on a living size pitch. So these three boys are trying to get the ball off it. And see, see which certain shape, as false as it is. I mean, you try and, you know, it's like pretty much walk it through. But sometimes that. You're not implementing that now, are you? Oh, As a manager? No, no, no. I can no, tell. No, no. No, we're um, all play short, sharp stuff now. Um, but everybody's got their own, obviously, they what they want to do and how they want to take the club forward and things. It's It, it was different. It was weird. I was talking about Roman off the hearts, but the Italians, the three o'clock thing was, that was, yeah, that was, that was weird. It's tough, I think, for a lot of coaches to come into Scottish football and try and change the entire culture mm-hmm. of a football club. Yep. And, you know, one of the, the kind of high-profile ones was Ronnie Dyla. He found it so difficult to try and get the senior pros buying in to what he was trying to implement. Some of the younger guys did it yep. uh, and obviously stayed in the team and Kieran Tierney was one of them yep. and got a big move. So I, I'm interested to know, you'd moved into England, you come back. You had a spell in Sweden. Yeah, so How this, was that experience? This came from the Italians, so they offered me a good deal of Livy, um, and in the club administration, etc., and nearly got sort of nearly folded. So we're actually all sitting at the reception desk, and we're just waiting for somebody to lock the doors, and that was us done. So eventually, you know, it was actually Jed Nixon, you know, making forward Jed Nixon, who was the painter and decorators. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm talking about that scene. Um, took over another couple of boys. Um, anyway, so they saved the club, and I was still in this contract on more money. Than what I should have been because the club got relegated for division. So at that stage, um, they had a meeting with me and they said, Joe, you're on X amount of money. We can't afford that. Um, can you pay wage cut? And see, but then I'm not being greedy, but I couldn't. Um, I couldn't afford to take the, the wage cut. And I'm not, I'm, I'm being honest. Um, I would if I could help the club, but so Lee Mako. Played well, I was mm-hmm. there, so he mm-hmm. went over to Sweden. He was managing the team, Osterson, who managed Jerry Brighton. He's a manager, actually. He was, um, I can't say his name now, right? He's a bank manager, but he was a manager, Austin as well. So Lee Mako fought me and says, Joe, do you want to come over? It'll be in loan. Um, so Livingston sorted that and I'm over to, over to Sweden through that. So because you get relegated to the third, I think maybe the team in Sweden were paying half the wages or whatever. So and yeah, I went over and it was. Again, when I say go down south, even go abroad to kids, whoever, you've got a yeah. chance to go. Mm-hmm. Go, I went over, loved it. Great experience. People were brilliant, looked after me. Um, yeah, it was what experience. Fair play to you, though. But again, for sharing your story with us, Joe. Um, and big shout out to your, your wife for standing by. Right. You know, tough, tough times. Yeah. You, you've then integrated yourself back into what would be Civvy Street. Mm-hmm. You're working, you're working hard. But... There's another part of this podcast that we spoke about um, your aspirations for Harrington Athletic in the coming season. So please tune into that. Um, But once again, I take my hat off to you. I mean, you've bared your soul there and you've you've told us. And I hope that someone watching this will be affected by it enough to go and ask for help, Joe. So thank you very much for joining me on A State of Mind. And you're welcome back anytime to chat with us in the future.